Okay, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, joining me here in person at Tokyo College uh, is Craig Jeffrey. Uh, Craig's Professor of Geography at the University of Melbourne, and he's perhaps best known for his research on young men in North India. Uh, his book Time Pass, which I should add has been translated into Japanese, uh, provides an in-depth look at the social lives of educated unemployed young men in the town of Mirat uh, and their multiple anxieties about time. Uh, Craig's also a former director of the Australia India Institute and has authored and co-authored several um, other books on contemporary India. Joining us on Zoom is uh, Jane Dyson, Associate Professor of Geography, also at the University of Melbourne. Uh, for around 20 years now, Jane has explored different aspects of social change in rural North India through the lens of a single village in Uttarakhand in the Indian Himalayas, which uh, she's given the pseudonym Bamni. Um, Jane has developed a rich understanding of the place and developed relationships with the people who live there. Uh, and uh, yeah, and her affection for the place and its people shines through in her writing. Um, Craig and Jane often work and write together. And what I've always found really inspiring um, about their work is its optimism. Um, they draw our attention to the positive aspects of young people's social and political action the ways in which they work to enhance the capabilities of others, how they preserve their, how they work to preserve their localities and cultures and promote positive forms of social change. Um, and I believe their presentation today um, will illustrate that optimism. So Craig will start by delivering a lecture and then Jane will be introducing her beautiful documentary film Spirit, which we'll then watch together. So I'll hand it over to you, Craig. Thank you very much. I hope uh, the sound is coming through all right for, for everybody. I'd first like to, to thank uh, Tokyo College and uh, Anada sensei Mino-sensei, uh, Brown-san, uh, and others, Tarada-san, for your assistance in uh, facilitating this presentation and my uh, coming to Tokyo. Uh, it's been only about 36 hours since I arrived and, and it's my first trip to Japan, but I have absolutely loved every minute of it. And I hope that um, I'll be able to, to return and, and also that um, Jane Dyson, who's joining by Zoom will be able to come and, and this can be the beginning of an association because uh, it's really wonderful to be here. And I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, as um, Brian San just explained, this is a joint paper that I'm giving that is written um, with Associate Professor Jane Dyson, and it emerges out of work that we, and particularly Jane, have been doing in the village of Bemni in India over the past 20 years, a village in Uttarakhand uh, state that I'll introduce in a moment. And the paper begins with a set of quite general, almost philosophical observations about life, uh, they're more social scientific than, than philosophical, and then plunges into the detail of some of the lives of people, especially young people in the village where we've been working. So we observe that social, economic and environmental crises have compelled many marginalized people to reflect on survival and viability in different places across the world. Many minoritized and marginalized populations are debating what constitutes a survive, survivable life, and in turn, how life can be arranged so that it's more than just survival. In the process, they're often analyzing how to conceptualize life. But despite these trends, scholarly accounts in the social sciences have been heavily skewed towards analysis of how institutions at the top, such as government, imagine and produce life and viability. This paper seeks to redress the balance by examining the spatial and temporal process through which young people envisage and build viable lives in an area of the Indian Himalayas. We develop our argument in part through engaging critically with the work of philosopher Giorgio Agamben. As many of you will know in his famous work, Agamben examines how states have exercised sovereign power over the past 2000 years through relegating sections of the population to what he terms bare life, a condition in which they're unable to participate in the ordinary political life of citizens. Agamben refers to camps, detention centers, 
and impoverished world regions, he refers to the global south as a whole, as sites in which a state of exception exists. In this state of exception and cast out of mainstream society, people are forced to live in a state of bare life. Hakan Bem's work has been enormously influential, but as many uh, geographers have pointed out, his discussion of political power exaggerates government dominance at the expense of analyzing human agency. It's also ahistorical, failing to engage with the diversity of ways in which power and social practice play out in specific places. A connected but relatively ignored weakness of Agambem's work is that he does not examine how people on the ground may conceptualize the situation of being forced to live in situations comparable to bare life, nor how people theorize life and viability. Haji, the, the work of the anthropologist Gassen Haj uh, helps to address this gap in Agambem's work. Building on Agambem, Haj argues that many governments are concerned to make life just bearable for people they regard as unworthy of living full human lives. Haj terms this minimal viability. But Haj also notes that marginalized people are often able to find ways to live beyond survival such that they achieve what he terms viability proper. Viability proper incorporates enjoyment, sociality, environmental engagement and ethical issues. Feminist scholar Judith Butler similarly explores this idea in her, in her account of livability. Butler uses this term livability to refer to how people's capacity to live beyond mere survival commonly depends upon a set of ethical dispositions. Broadly, these dispositions include a tendency to value the lives of others, nurture social relationships, and maintain the eth ethical and environmental frameworks that support life. Recent social science work, and I'm particularly familiar with human geography and anthropological work, offers a basis for developing Hodge and Butler's ideas about populations building proper viability or livability and doing so with respect to ideas of life. For example, Benjamin Fash and colleagues have described how socioeconomic and environmental crises have compelled many members of indigenous populations in Latin America to focus on issues of survival. They concentrate on core dimensions of life, such as food, shelter, and work. But Fash et al. also argue that crises have compelled uh, indigenous people to think afresh about what it means to survive well. This effort to build what Hodge would term proper viability entails reflection on ethically important ideas about how society should be democratically organized, social relationships, environmental care, and spiritual and cultural health. In the remainder of the paper, we develop this idea of proper viability through reference to field research in rural North India. We show how young people in Bemni village are engaged in social action that simultaneously focuses on survival and involves youth in reflecting on what it means to be living beyond survival, reflection that's often oriented around particular vernacular ideas of life. Bemni village, where um, Jane in particular has been working for for 20 years is located at about 2,700 meters in altitude in rural Chamoli district in the Indian state of Uttarakhand. In 2012, the village had a population of about 1,000 people. Its economy remains primarily agricultural. Households cultivate crops largely for subsistence while managing the surrounding forest for pastoral use. Women are mainly responsible for agricultural work, none of which is mechanized. 75% of villagers were higher caste Hindus or Rajputs and 25% Dalits in uh, 2012 when uh, uh, Jane last did a census in the village. In general, higher castes own more land than Dalits and partly as a result are often slightly wealthier, but all Dalit households own some land in Bemni 
and were not employed in the fields of higher caste on a regular basis. Caste inequalities are therefore quite different from contiguous parts of Plains, India. Gender inequalities persist in the village. Women lack control over household finances and are expected to conduct the vast majority of farming work. Education has led some young women to challenge aspects of hierarchy and patriarchy, however, and we've written on this um, recently. Between 2003 and the present, the government initiated a range of, of infrastructural initiatives that have, a made, have had a major impact on the village. Between 2008 and 2012, the government installed electricity, built a road connecting Bemni to a nearby town, and created several schools and community buildings. This has enabled children to study up to secondary school in Bemni. But farming remains the major livelihood strategy, but it's becoming increasingly difficult as climate change has led to unpredictable and extreme weather events, successive monsoon rainfall, increasingly dry winters, and hailstorms that damage crops. Young men and the increasing proportion of young women have sought off farm employment. They've typically failed to find secure public sector work, however, reflecting a shortage of government jobs relative to demand. In addition, the low incomes of most villages, combined with geographical remoteness and poor infrastructure, often limited possibilities to start local businesses. Many young men and the small number of educated young women have responded to these pressures through migrating to urban areas for work. However, a lack of social contacts, high rents, and the absence of secure well-paid employment made it diff very difficult for young people from all caste groups to develop livelihoods in cities. Jane conducted 15 months of field research in Bemni in 2003 to four, focusing primarily on children's work and schooling, but also encompassing research with 18 to 45 year olds. Between 2011 and 2022, she returned 11 times and I returned four times to Bemni, together completing a combined 19 months of field work. As part of this field work, we conducted participant observation and open-ended interviews with 35 young men. Do you want to try to share your screen one more time? Oh, yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, we, we conducted participant observation and open-ended in interviews with 35 young men, 30 uh, Rajput and 5 Dalit, and 30 young women, 25 Rajput and 5 Dalit, all of whom had been educated at least up to high school, up to class 10. A remarkable feature of our conversations with young people about uh, their lives and social action was the extent to which they reflected on the importance of survival, using the English word or the phrase being able to carry on. The example of uh, Chal Sakna. The example of a, of a Rajput young man named Mavia Singh, who came from a relatively poor household, is indicative. Mavia had been educated up to class 12 in the early 2000s, but his schooling had been patchy. The teachers were negligent. He often missed classes to help with farm work. His family were unable to pay for college, and so after school, Mavia immediately sought paid work. He joined a cousin in Mumbai, where he worked as a security guard in a shopping mall. But the job offered no training or prospects of advancement, and it was difficult to pay his expenses. When his mother fell ill in 2011, Mavia returned to the village. Some months later, we met him, ushering his mules up to the new dirt road that led to the village. Mavia plunged straight into talking about life, Jeevan and the challenges of forging a livelihood in Bemni. I've just got back, he said, and so I have to find a way to survive, survive Kandapatte. In the village, Mavir worked on the government's Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. He worked in house construction. He'd used his savings to buy two mules from which he earned an income hauling building materials, taking on occasional portering jobs for trekkers, or moving for three months a year to work as a porter at pilgrimage sites in Uttarakhand. I've built a life, Jeevan, he said. This combination of earning opportunities was constantly in flux, however. In 2013, while portering at the pilgrimage site of Kedana, Mavia was trapped in the mountains for a month by the devastating floods that killed thousands. Deeply traumatized, he vowed never to return and concentrated on work in the village. Two years later, excessively heavy rain caused landslides that destroyed some of his fields, 
so he took up construction work outside the village to compensate for the loss. This changed again when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March 2020 and India was plunged into lockdown. During the two years that he did not leave the village, Marvia turned to local building projects and experimented with new cash crops. As he reflected on these shifts, Marvia emphasized that he had to focus on basic life. Marvi's experiences resonate with those of many other young men in Bemli. Most had some experience of migrating out of the village, and in most cases, this experience had been unsuccessful, even among households wealthier than Marvi's. Young women were much less likely to migrate to cities or conduct other paid work outside or within the village, but young women had had similarly dispiriting experiences of acquiring poor quality education, applying for salaried jobs, and balancing different forms of work. In young women's case, typically farm work, household work, and caring responsibilities. Marvi's example is also indicative of young people's social work. Marvi argued that his own life would not be viable unless he also assisted the village. He said that climate change was making farming increasingly difficult. Medical facilities were practically absent. Schools lacked resources. Young people feared these problems would encourage an increasing number of young adults to migrate out of Bemni, leaving it a ghost village. For example, a young, as a result of this fear of, of village depopulation, they became involved in social action. Mavio and other young people often led initiatives to address infrastructural problems. In the frequent periods when the village water pressure or supply was low due to faulty pipes, or a landslide higher up the mountain, Marvi and others would spend hours or even days working to solve the issue. Much of this work was also social. He advised other young people about employment opportunities and invested effort in improving education. Dalit young men often worked alongside higher caste young men, particularly in assisting with infrastructural projects. Young women in Bemni carried out a range of activities similar to that described for Marvia, assisting with village level infrastructural issues and providing educational and health advice in particular. A running theme of young people's social action was its role in connecting different spaces and domains together, which they felt was crucial for survival, child succubus. Young people argue that they were not simply, though, engaged in ensuring minimal viability, to use Gus and Hodge's term, or living a narrow, bearable, or bare life to invoke Agamben. They said they were also concerned with how to live an ethical life, maximize opportunities for positive affects, such as joy, mother, and acknowledge and support aspects of cultural practice. Young people sometimes made a, a distinction in this context between simply surviving chaltehe and surviving well, tikse chalta, or between jivan and leading a good life, achi jivan. This point about young people's reflection on life beyond survival is connected to the observation that young people frequently made in Bemni that while jivan was often their focus, they were also centrally interested in nurturing puri life, a term they used to refer to the social, environmental, and cultural spirit, a cultural and spiritual milieu in which they lived, a milieu much broader than the village and roughly associated with the administrative block, as well as the wider Chamoli district. The dual process of addressing Jivan and Puri life and the opportunities this provided for affective, ethical, and cultural expression emerged regularly in Bemni. And we're going to, in the remainder of the paper, just tell two stories that illustrate this connection between Jeevan and Puri Lai. One such example occurred in March 2017, when Marvia led an expedition to rescue an injured villager. It was already late afternoon when Marvia jogged quickly past our courtyard. What's the rush, we asked. Without stopping, he called back up. There's been an emergency and we need to make a plan. Come if you like. In the village, we joined a gathering of mostly young men. Rather vague news had reached us that an unidentified goat herder had been badly bitten by a dog and was stranded in a high altitude meadow. Marvia directed the, 
the deliberations. With no road access to such a remote region and no trained medical team in the village, the man would need to be carried back to Bemney before finding transport to a clinic in a nearby town. Twelve young men of different economic and caste backgrounds immediately volunteered to assist with the rescue. The, the, the light was already fading when Marvia led the group, which included me, out of the village. With playful competitive, competitiveness, several men joked about who was the fittest as they strode up the steep rocky path. Others sang Garwali songs, praising the beauty of the landscape. Marvia po pointed out a spot where he'd previously encountered a ghost, and others talked of their fear of these remote areas. They stopped regularly, regularly at small shrines where they oft offered gifts to the gods and uttered short prayers seeking protection. At 11 p.m., after five hours of relentless climbing, the now silent group finally reached the injured man and his friend, both huddled by a fire. Neither man was from Bemney after all, but Marvia quickly assessed the injury and applied clean bandages. He laid out the options for the rescue and after lengthy discussions decided that the man was well enough to wait overnight and ride a mule down to Bemney in the morning from where he'd be taken by jeep to the local hospital. Mavia promised the men he would arrange the mule with some herders that they'd met on the way up, who were staying in their summer huts. Having settled on the plan, one man took out a slab of about 50 chapatis wrapped in newspaper, while another revealed an enormous slab of packaged biscuits. The herders offered around goat meat that had been toasting over the fire. The laughter returned as the young man beginning, began telling stories once more. Sometime after midnight, Marvia stood up, signalling the end of the impromptu party. He promised the injured man that another rescue party would arrive with a mule in the morning and called everyone to gather their bags. The men began skipping downhill. At a large scree slope, they raced each other, jumping onto each other's backs, for piggyback rides. Finally, long past three in the morning, the group turned the last zigzag into Bemney, called hushed greetings to each other and returned exhausted to their respective homes. In reflecting on this rescue attempt the next day, Marvia said that the mission was partly about ensuring that life, Jeevan, was possible in Bemney through the provision of key services. But he said that the incident also highlighted opportunities to strengthen social, environmental and spiritual dynamics that are affectively, culturally and ethically important and exceed basic life. Marvu explained that they were part of a network of villages in the region for whom reciprocal collective action was a given. During the rescue, Marvi and the other young men had also referred to the event as an opportunity to affirm the, their connection to the natural and spiritual environment which they regarded as crucial to leading a good Achi life. The rescue is indicative of many other instances in which young men intervened to help others to acquire healthcare. But the rescue was also an occasion where young men could collectively affirm their commitment to Puri life, the social, environmental and spiritual milieu in which they lived and in which they learned to live beyond survival. The management of the health of a woman named Roshni Devi illustrates further how engagement with Puri life offered opportunities to build ethical values, cultural meaning, and positive affect. Roshni arrived in Bemni in 2004 as a newly married daughter-in-law to a family with whom Jane was close. A strong worker, she quickly slipped into the role as the household's primary farmer. In many senses, the household's future rested on Roshni's capacity both to farm effectively and produce the next generation. But several years passed and Roshni was unable to conceive. Roshni's husband, who had spent only the first year of their marriage in the village, had returned to a restaurant job in Delhi and visited only rarely. When he did, he would accompany Roshni to nearby towns to seek medical tests for their infertility. In 2009, he finally consulted a religious leader, a pundit, who concluded that Roshni had been possessed by a spirit. It emerged a couple of years prior to the wedding. Roshni had been collecting firewood in the forest on the high ridge that separated the land between her natal village and Bemni. She remembered playfully imitating being possessed by a ghost, dancing and throwing her hair around. It had just seemed like harmless fun. 
But now it was understood that her disrespect had angered a spirit and that she was being punished through her infertility. She realized that her action had not been respectful of Puri life, as a villager put it. The pundit recommended they invest in an exorcism ceremony. He identified a location where the ceremony should occur, high above the village on the edge of the forest, chosen to represent where Roshni had become possessed. In preparation, Roshni's husband went directly to seek Mavi's help in gathering a group of young men to assist with the ceremony. They'd all participated in several such exorcisms and were essential for its success. On the chosen day, Mavi and eight other young men accompanied Roshni, her husband, the pundit, and J Jane up to the spot. The young men set to work arranging a temporary temple in front of a small rock where they lay down some women's personal items, a headscarf, comb, and bindis, while others collected firewood. Using a mix mixture of flour and water, Mavi crafted an effigy of the spirit's face, decorated with comic gruesomeness. The pundit had prepared the temple ground with patterns made with powdered dye, pots of turmeric, milk, and water, into which he dipped sprigs of leaves. A goat, brought at great expense for the occasion, was blessed before being sacrificed, and blood from its decapitated head dripped over the effigy. Meanwhile, Mavi and the young men cleaned the goat and roasted it on the fire, carefully disposing of the stomach contents so, that it was not, so as not to pollute the scene. Over the next couple of hours, they ate heartily and with great joy before packing the remaining meat to share in the village. Mavi explained that while the puja and their own labor was primarily for Roshni, they also took it as an opportunity to acknowledge the gods' protection for their collective well-being, which they should never take for granted. Two years after the exorcism in 2011 and still unable to conceive, Roshni accompanied her husband to Delhi where she underwent scans and sur surgery to treat her infertility. They decided she would stay for longer term treatment and she found paid work looking after an elderly couple. They visited Bemni twice a year and continued to consult villagers and the pundit about their predicament. Finally, in 2014, 10 years into a childless marriage, they'd saved enough to invest in a more elaborate ceremony to seek the advice of a deity in Bemni. Jane was in the village once more when Roshni and her husband arrived for their dancing puja. Starting late in the afternoon, crowds of villagers gathered in the family courtyard as two Dalit musicians called on the deity with leather and tin drums, accompanied by village dancers clothed in ceremonial dresses. Eventually, the deity took over the bodies of Roshni and an, and an oracle, and for several hours danced wildly and expanded their rage. Once again, again, the ceremony had relied heavily on young men to support it. Mavir and several sp friends spent hours preparing a courtyard, erecting awnings, building a fire, and so on. Even more than the relatively small scale of the ghost exorcism, this ceremony relied heavily on the collective participation of many villagers. The deity needed to be coaxed into the oracle with men's dances and women's chants. Nine months after the puja, in early 2015, a baby born boy was born, followed two years later by another boy. The following year, in 2018, Jane was present again when Roshni and her husband returned for another ceremony, this time to thank the deity. It was a slightly smaller affair, conducted inside a packed room. The atmosphere was relaxed, happy, but still reverent, as the deity revealed themselves in the bodies of Roshni and the oracle. Again, Mavi and his friends supported the puja and reflected on it as an opportunity to celebrate efforts to improve Roshni's health and express the, their gratitude to the gods for their collective well-being. Roshni's struggle to conceive offers another example of the importance for young people and other villagers of attending simultaneously to Jeevan and Puri life, in this case in an effort that spanned 14 years. Young men provided logistical assistance that required extensive skills and knowledge. For example, they ensured that villagers com complied with a complex set of rituals. In doing so, they drew on and cross-referenced prior experiences with pujas in the village, including those connected to the life cycle of birth, marriage, and death. 
In such ways, in this and other examples, young people reaffirm their commitment to working intensively to assist villagers with core issues related to human living and to celebrating a wider ethically valued social environment and environmental and spiritual cultural milieu, Puri life. The, the exorcism reproduced gendered concepts around women's responsibilities relating to work and their bodies and their subordination to men. It's contradictory in that respect. Such practices also reinforced caste roles in them. At the same time, however, spirit possession offers women a means of positioning themselves as central to the production of ethical value in Bemni, to sometimes express some suffering and influence social outcomes. To conclude, climate change, a lack of jobs and poor welfare services were radically altering how lives could be led in Bemni, sometimes seemingly necessitating a focus on survival and simply what Hajj would call bearable life. Young people focused on the pursuit of jivan, understood as meeting core needs related to food, housing, infrastructure, education, health, work, and security. This entailed concentrating on minimal viability. At the same time, however, young people argue that their lives afforded opportunities to pursue ethical projects and build cultural meaning and positive affect. Theirs were not bare life in Agamben's terms. These ethical and cultural effective opportunities emerged especially through their collective work to nurture the wider social, environmental, and spiritual cultural milieu, which they often labeled Puri life. In the Bemni context, then, proper viability in Haji's terms emerges as a spatially and temporary, temporarily complex process of extracting value out of the inseparability of human life, jivan, and the wider life, puri life, in which people are enmeshed. So thank you very much. I think um, I apologize for the technical difficulties there, but hopefully it all came across well on Zoom and you'll see the village in a moment. No problem. Uh, thank you very much, Craig, uh, for that really rich presentation. Uh, I really like the way that you sort of articulate and draw our attention to the ways that everyday action and everyday responses to crises involve sort of ethical considerations, involve spiritual consideration and, and thoughts about what, what constitutes the good life. Um, I was wondering if perhaps you could comment on the implications for understandings of sustainability. I mean, you mentioned uh, climate change there, but it seemed to me that uh, the crises that these young people are responding to uh, are often related very much to their immediate experiences, whereas uh, a lot of aspects of sustainability and, and particularly around climate change involve not just the you know immediate experience of livelihood insecurity, but also the projection based on sort of scientific mm -hmm. knowledge that mm -hmm. things are going to get worse. So I'm just wondering if in, in young people's action that you've observed, are they also sort of building in these projections of long-term future mm -hmm. and, and how they can be responsive to that uh, in their everyday action? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, the, the, their, their practices are operating with different kinds of notions of temporality in play, if I can answer the question in, in that way. So on the one hand, there is this sort of hustle, this need to be constantly adjusting. Um, and the, and the, word, the, the English word adjust is used quite a lot in this context to the unpredictable nature of social and environmental change is reflected in that portion of the presentation when I talked about how Mavia had had to move between different forms of livelihood. There is that sense of, of hustle. Uh, but, but there is also a, 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 a concern with other kinds of temporalities. Um, so with the, the, the long-term sort of more cyclical notions of non-linear time associated with some of the ritual practices in the village with, um, with Puri life as a, as a system. Uh, and in that context, a, a concern with a very long run process where in climate change and aspects of human activity in this region is, is leading to quite marked and rapid, but also long-term environmental degradation. I think that's a central part 
of people's concern over the the potential for the village not to actually be viable over the long run so and this often that kind of temporality and that kind of long run future projection is often discussed in in generational terms i've grown up in the village i'm in my 20s or early 30s will my children be able to grow up in the village will their children be able to grow up in the village and and so there's the the, the very much is that that long-term thinking about not just environmental sustainability but social sustainability sustainability at different scales mm. going on in Bemney mm. and, and 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 it'd be interesting to hear Jane answer that question but I guess maybe it's something that that she could pick up in, in talking about the film yes, as well certainly. which which is very closely connected to what I've just said right right so uh we will have the the opportunity for for the audience to ask Craig some questions at the end but for now we're going to uh switch over to to Jane Dyson who is going to uh, introduce the documentary film Spirit so Jane thanks so much um and I just also just like to start with um you know adding my thanks for inviting us um to present um our work and and this short film um, and thank you to all of the, the team there um, for making these arrangements um, to make it possible for me to join you um, today. Um, I just also like to say that I'm, I'm talking today from Melbourne, from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so as Trent said, I just before we show the film, I just want to spend you know, five minutes introducing it um, and then we'll we'll share the link to the film and um, we'll have time to discuss at the end. Um, so I want to just talk a bit about how it fits into our broader research and also why a film rather than writing um, seemed uh, an, an, an appropriate me a medium um, as well as the papers that we write. So the film is based in the same village as, as Benmi. Um, of, of Bemi that Craig has presented. Um, and as you know, I've worked in this very village um, over a 10 year period. And after about 10, sorry, uh, over a 20 year period, after about 10 years of working there, um, there'd already been so many changes in the village since when I had first arrived. So there was now a road and electricity, there were te telecommunications and some new schools. And villagers began to say to me that they really wanted to document their own story of change. Um, you know, in addition to the to the writing that I was doing, that they said, look, we can't read this, um, but but we want to be part of telling our own story. And so we discussed lots of options of how to do this in a collaborative way that was accessible to everyone, not just academics. Um, and a short film seemed to be the best way. And over a couple of years, we worked together um, to work out how, how to tell that story. And so that was the first film that I made in the in the village, uh, which I'm not going to screen today. That was called um, Lifelines. And it focused on this story of change. And after screening the film in the village, that first film, my conversations with uh, villagers really began to explore in more detail that the impact of these very rapid changes on everyday social and cultural practice, and what these changes really mean for how one thinks about life and what a viable life in the village um, in the Himalayas really means. And villagers were keen to show that there was more to life in this region than simply development or infrastructural change. They wanted to show this in another film. So we talked about how work and future aspirations fit into ideas about meaningful and sustainable life. Um, and also about how those ideas had shifted over generations. Um, but we were also really interested in the kind of broader understandings of what made life possible and viable in the region. So in much the same way as we presented in the paper, the film is really concerned about these two kind of codependent ideas about what a viable life looks and feels like. So on the one hand, it's about their survival, the work that must, one must do to sustain a family, the difficult decisions one makes to make that possible. Um, these decisions are often made and experienced within the family or, or household level, or perhaps even at an individual level. Um, and as I said, they might change over generations. But on the other hand, it's also about this much broader spiritual and social and, and environmental milieu in which life is played out. Um, and particularly the importance of the kind of non-human entities within that. So the gods and the spirits that share the land, the livestock, the forest, uh, and the complex interplay between all of these. 
So, so the film really deals with these two ideas of life through two interwoven stories. So we have first the story of a woman named Saraswati. Um, it's about her own individual and family struggles to create a viable life in Bemni um, and the work and decisions that that involves. And so interwoven with this story around Saraswati is also uh, a story of the village as a more collective entity um, as the village prepares for and celebrates a nine day festival called the Pandav Leela. I just want to tell you a little bit about the festival before we start. So the Pandav Leela is a, a 10 day reenactment um, of parts of the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. It tells the story of the five Pandava brothers, but it's not just simply theater. It has a really strong ritual purpose. So the key characters in the festival are all chosen or picked by the gods and they become possessed by those gods during the dances. Um, the dancing of the Pandav, the, um, the, the whole festival is believed to protect the village livestock from outbreaks of foot and mouth disease. So without doing the Pandav, they, the gods become angry and they curse the village. So, so the, the festival is really inextricably linked to ideas about what makes life viable in that much broader sense of the, the spiritual, social and environmental milieu. Um, the festival itself uh, is a huge commitment that involves the entire village in preparations um, for the nightly performances. And these performances tend to start at about nine in the evening and go on till about three in the morning, um, every night for nine nights, um, alongside a whole range of um, events that happen during the day. And it also occurs in the really freezing cold of early December. So after three months of really intensive harvesting work, um, so when the already exhausted villagers become kind of increasingly delirious throughout the festival. Um, the festival, though, provides this really critical opportunity for villagers to gather together in celebration of life um, in, in its entirety um, before the kind of much more solitary uh, winter begins. So um, while we've obviously written about notions of life, the film really offers this opportunity to explore some of these ideas from a more kind of intimate and experiential perspective. Um, it provides access to the visual and acoustic worlds of everyday practice and belief. And it gives us a sense of what a viable life in its many different forms um, might actually feel like, how it becomes experienced. So with that, I'll leave you um, to, to watch the film. Um, I think uh, the best way that we'll do this is to share the link to the film. Um, we should then all go off, uh, watch it independently on our, on our screens if we're on Zoom or for those in, who are in the room um, and then come back together. Is that, yes, is that, that right, Trent? That's right. So, so we'll just po we've just posted the uh, link to the video uh, in the chat. So we just ask you to uh, stay in the Zoom room, but follow the link. Uh, keep your mics switched off, and uh, we'll call you back as a group when uh, when we can resume the discussion.